how should someone think about building a framework of how they can take the tactics that we talk about today and actually use them? As we mentioned at the very start, compliance, adherence can have the best strategy in the world. If you don't end up applying it, it means nothing. What is your uh, best advice on how people can form a framework of tools that they can actually use? Well, I think you have to start with the objective. I've always talked about this way more than a decade, and I certainly have written the book through this lens, which is you go from objective to strategy to tactics. So we always wanna start with the objective, and I do think it's worth being clear for any individual what their objective is. You know, when you go to your doctor, it, that's not a common question. What is your objective? Um, and again, it's not the fault of the doctor. I think it's the fault of the system. The system isn't really set up to ask that question. The, set up, the system is more set up to kind of play a bit of whack-a-mole. Is there a problem right now? Is there a symptom right now that I need to address? But if you're trying to play this sort of long game, you have to work backwards and say, okay, what do you want to be true at the end of your life? And the, the framework that I use for that is called the marginal decade. So the marginal decade is the last decade of your life. Everyone will have a marginal decade. And that's not a pleasant thought for many of us to think about, right? I don't love thinking about the fact that I'm going to have a marginal decade, but I will. Now, you never know the day you enter your marginal decade. But many people know when they are in it. And the question then becomes, what do you want to be true in that decade? How old are you, Chris? 35. Okay. So let's just assume your marginal decade is kind of the ninth to 10th decade of your life. What do you want to be true in that decade? I would like to still be able to move without assistance. What would, kind of moving? Uh, I would love to be able to still walk. Okay. Uh, I would love to be, I adore dogs. So being able to take the dog for a walk, being able to throw the ball. How big a dog? Golden retriever. Okay. Is that a big dog? Yeah. Big for a 90 year old? Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Big golden retriever. Okay. I would so you want to be able to walk a golden retriever? Yep. How far? 30 minutes on 30 the morning. 30 minutes a day? Okay. Yep. Uh, maybe twice a day if I could at best. Do you want to live in a house that's got uh, a balcony? Okay. So would need to be able to go up and down stairs. Okay. Um, would love to still be able to pick up grandchildren. I have no idea whether that's realistic at 90 years old, but that would be something I'd love to do. Pick them up from the floor, from a crib? Both. Where? Would s love to have still a good quality of sleep. Would love to be able to... Have sex? At 90? Yep. Not something I've considered. Good question. Okay. Let's say yes. Let's say yes, I'm still going at 90. And probably most importantly, above all of this, is still have proper cognitive function. Like still, I, I value the quality of my thoughts more than anything mm -hmm. on the planet. So this is a valuable exercise because I don't think a lot of people do this. But I, I think everybody needs to do this and needs to go really far down the rabbit hole. And what you'll realize is, by the way, everything you've said is totally reasonable. Like I have some people when you play this game with them, first thing they say is, I want to be heli skiing when I'm 90. And it's like, I'm not going to tell you that's not possible, but like that that's the first thing you would say is a little odd, right? Everything you're saying is achievable but is challenging. So for example, walking a golden retriever, actually look at the force that's in that leash and the amount of balance and strength and lower leg variability you need to not fall over when that's happening. By the time you're in your 70s, that's going to be very difficult. So you have to build up an enormous reserve in those capacities today to cope with and anticipate the inevitable decline that's going to come in all of those. That's how you start. You start with the objective, you reverse engineer what the implication of each objective is. Mm -hmm. You un We understand pretty well what the decline of those properties looks like. So we've got uh, objective. Yep. Then we have to think about what the strategy is. It's very complicated in this problem. Is this so, where people get lost? I think so. I think this is the step that most people just skip altogether and go right to the tactics. So they say, okay, I, I hear you on objectives. Now tell me how to eat, how to exercise, how to sleep, et cetera. And I think you can't skip this bucket. And th there's a reason that those like chapters in the book that are devoted to this. If you're, if you're trying to, if you're asking questions that are straightforward, you don't really need a strategy. So if you said to me, Peter, my objective right now is not to get a sunburn. I don't, we don't need a major strategy. Like it's relatively straight. We can go straight to tactics. You're going to avoid the sun altogether. If you need to be in the sun, you're going to wear long sleeves and a hat, and you're going to wear sunscreen and blah, 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 blah. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. But when you say my objective is to live 10 years longer than I otherwise would and do so at a much higher function as evidenced by that list of things you just said, well, I can't just jump to tactics. They're not obvious. So instead, I have to go through a whole bunch of indirect measures because I don't have what I really want, right? What I really want is I'd love to be able to rely on the gold standard 
which is randomized controlled experiments that would give me the answer. But for reasons that are self-evident and obvious and not worth explaining, we don't have randomized controlled experiments that answer all the questions um, that pertain to taking a 35-year-old and setting him up to be the best 95-year-old. So we have to have an option B. And option B really rests on a whole bunch of other pillars of strategic insight. So one of those things is what are the inferences we can make from observational data of long-lived, well-functioned humans? So looking at the centenarians, for example, who we very quickly figure out are genetically gifted. So their, 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 their superpower was picking the right parents, um, but we can still learn a lot from them. Uh, we'll put that aside for a moment. The other thing we, we can look at is short-term human studies that don't cover the hard outcome, such as the full duration of your life, but cover certain things. So for example, there might be hard outcome studies that look at heart disease or stroke or hard outcomes that look at performance and functional metrics such as strength, resilience, and things like that. We then look at animal literature or non-human literature, I think to be more accurate, that looks at the full duration outcome. So I think we can look at some of those animal studies and get a pretty good sense of what's affecting lifespan and health span, but we have to be careful with it like we do with everything in that we, we want to be very thoughtful that we're not just sort of zeroing in on one model. So this is again, where, where we look at things that favor lots of models. So, you know, something that's consistent across mice and worms and flies and dogs is much more interesting than something that is only going to work in one mouse model in one person's lab. Then we want to look at mechanistic studies. So how can we understand, for example, the benefits of exercise when we look at the cellular level, when we understand the, you know, when we look at proteomic metabolomic changes of exercise and how do, you know, what do those things tell us as an example about say exercise or sleep restriction or dietary restriction. And then the final tool that I think we look at in our strategy bucket is Mendelian randomization. So sometimes you actually let nature do the randomized controlled experiment for you. So Mendelian randomizations are very elegant types of studies where when you can find genes that are responsible for phenotypes of interest, you can ask the question, as nature shuffles those genes, do we establish causality by the outcome? So when you put all five of those together, that's how you start to cobble together what your tactics are. And that's the final piece of it. So what are your tactics? You basically have five domains. You have all things that pertain to what you eat, all things that pertain to how you exercise and move, how you sleep, all the drugs, molecules, supplements, hormones that you could possibly take. And then all the, you know, call it the bucket of things that you would do to manage emotional and mental health. When you break it down like that, longevity seems very simple that you have these five key areas that you're focused on. Where are people focusing their attention in your opinion when it comes to both health span and lifespan longevity that have the shortest levers, but people are giving undue attention to? Yeah, that's such a great question. I, I think what's what I find funny is that everybody, and I'm sure, I mean, I'm not sure, I know I've been guilty of this myself. It's very tempting to just focus on your favorite thing. Like there was a point in time where virtually all of my attention was focused on nutrition. Hmm. Like I really felt that nutrition was the the alpha and the omega of this entire equation. And all you had to do was sort of eat a certain way and everything was going to work itself out. Obviously, the medical establishment is hyper-focused on the, the medicine side of this, as evidenced by the fact that's the only thing we learned in medical school and residency, right? It's not like anybody taught you how to administer exercise or nutrition. Even if you knew that those things mattered, you had no education in how to actually do anything about it. It would sort of be like an oncologist who knows chemotherapy is good, but doesn't know anything else. Like doesn't know which chemotherapy or what dose or what schedule or what biomarkers to use to track the progress of the chemotherapy in the, um, you know, in the tumor as it regresses. So, so each, each, each entity I think just kind of has their own expertise.